The following podcast is brought to you by cdkoffers.com. Use offer code broken silicon for 25% off Windows codes and die shrink for 3% off all other codes. Links in the description and I will say more later, but for now, let's get to the show. And welcome to Broken Silicon, a PC hardware and computer gaming podcast. Your host, Tom, and uh, I'm joined by the coronavirus infected. Yes, I got the corona right here, right beside me. I got to say, you sound fine. So the coronavirus doesn't really give you a bad throat, does it? No, no. You just get really dizzy and you start vomiting late at night. That's that's usually how it goes. Okay. So, I mean, yeah. (laughs) There's pros and cons to every yeah. cold. Yeah, there's some upsides. You get some boosted confidence when you're at the bar, you know, things like that. So I think you might just be drinking. I thought that's what the coronavirus was all about. Oh, I see. But so I actually, I'm curious. So when I get a cold, well, actually, let me back up. When I was in high school through college, every time I got a cold, it would just start as a lingering sore throat. I wouldn't have a sore throat, but I could tell I'm about to get one. Uh, And then I'd like sneeze a lot. The sneezing would go away. The sore throat would get worse. And then I'd get better in a few days. And in the past three years, the older I get, now I just cough a lot. Like, I don't know. Do you have the same symptoms every cold? Because I notice other different friends never get sore throats or they cough more. No, mine's very uh, predictable. It starts with the sore throat and then it goes into the chest, then turns into the head cold, and then you're good. Yeah. I will say, since I've become an adult, I don't get headaches anymore. I, I, I don't. I, again, this is completely off subject, but I'm just curious. Like, do you notice you get less headaches as you get older, or more? Um, I, I still get headaches. It just depends on what's going on. I used to get a lot more when I was working retail, but uh, de- definitely less now. Okay. Well, this wasn't supposed to be a random banter cold podcast. So I guess <laughs> I guess let's just dive into it. You actually um I wasn't sure if I was going to come on yours or not, but then I thought about well, th- first you said you'll come on mine today. And I was like, "Oh, okay." And then I realized, well, I can push back that one pre-recorded one that was going to come out Wednesday. So yeah, I guess this is kind of perfect timing, especially with more and more rumors about Big Navi and Ampere coming out, which let me say this quickly, guys. I'm saying Ampere correctly because the French guy had an accent in his name and the English spelling of the unit Ampere, which is how NVIDIA has been spelling it so far, does not have the accent mark. It's not Ampere. It's Ampere. I took five years of French. All right. And I'm going to say times 86, NVIDIA and (laughs) Narvi as many times as I want. You're just going to have to deal with it. I wanted to just get that out of the way. Well, I kind of agree. Ampere is the way that it would appear to be pronounced. Now, if they add the accent mark on their marketing, which would be very yeah. pretentious, but if they do, I will say it a different way. No, no. They wouldn't be pretentious. They'll just call it super or something like that. You know, Let you know that it's for real. Yeah. Well, and I guess let me ask you this quickly because I'm curious. I heard that they can't use the name Ampere because of another patent, but they keep seemingly referring to it as that in internal documents. So. Have you seen any? Uh, do you do you know the rumor I'm talking about? That was that they can't use the name Ampere because of yeah, other... yeah. yeah. I, I remember that coming up, and then people were floating out other possible code names. Um, when it comes down to like names and stuff like that, they can't take another company's logo, but mm-hmm. a company can't own a name. You know, it's like you can't mark or uh, you know completely monopolize. Uh, For example, like the word chicken, KFC can't own the word chicken or something like that. And KFC can mean any number of, you know, things, any acronym you want. So they can't even own that. They can just own that logo. So NVIDIA can use Ampere if they want to. Yes, the other company can take them to court and drain their money. They'll lose in court. Mm -hmm. But and that's probably what they might want to avoid is just wasting time and money. Right. 
Well, and they tried to patent, well, they did. They successfully uh, or trademarked the names 3080, 50, 4080, and all of that too. And AMD, just to make things easy on themselves, seemingly changed the name of the RDNA series to the 5000, 5700, 5800, instead of going with the rumors for a long time where that they were going to call the 5700, the 3060 or 3070. Well, I mean, that's just kind of what AMD has been doing lately. You know, you see them doing that with Intel. It's like, we're just one generation ahead of you with our naming scheme. And I mean, it's smart marketing. I thought it it made sense too. Yeah. Um, But for the most part, I mean, it doesn't really matter what NVIDIA calls it. They can call it whatever they want. It's the next generation NVIDIA card. And that's where things get interesting. So I just hope um, they never use super gear, super again, but we'll see. uh, Yeah, I don't like super. That's what the TI was originally designed for when they would do like a refresh or an update. (laughs) That's what TI was designed for. But anyways, I guess let's continue. So I made that video about the MX350. And again, it's one of those videos where I'll see a couple comments go, oh, I guess you ran out of things to talk about. But it's not. I was talking to Dan on the phone and I realized I'd been ranting about the MX350 to him for about 30 minutes. And I'm like, oh, I've got an entire script here for, or it's like when I put together the script for Broken Silicon, I noticed like if I have a news story and me and Dan are writing notes and the notes become a page long for one news story, I go, maybe this should just be its own video. I understand most people don't want to talk about the MX350 and its implications, but it's something I found really interesting. And I got to say, you commented on that video. It was complete luck I noticed your comment, by the way. I just want to like, <laughs> don't be afraid to message me on Discord if you're, you want to talk about any videos we make, because uh, I know it seems like I comment on my YouTube comments a lot, but it's very, very erratic. It's basically like, you know, if I'm drinking at night and bored <laughs> or if I wake when, up in when the morning. When you have morning, the coronavirus, right? Yeah, that's when I comment. So yes, there's days I understand people where I <laughs> I seem to respond to every single comment in one video. But don't comment in YouTube and just expect my response to anyone because there will just be entire days where I don't respond to anybody. But so I guess... um and, and and I I I guess you wanted to come on though because you're you're reshuffling your channel. I actually was considering coming on yours because I am rebooting Flyover State soon. But I've I've actually recorded two of the episodes or the majority of them, and I'm gonna actually like bank three in a row so there's no droughts. Like it's just like a once a month or something thing. And so yeah, I'll come on yours to promote that. But I don't know if you want to get that out of the way in the beginning of the podcast. Just kind of like what you wanted to announce about your channel. Well, this is kind of something going on in the background. Um, I'm actually going to do a dedicated video on my channel about it, but I'm going to revamp things a bit and mix things up and kind of just change the whole format. Kind of want to go more professional direction with everything. And instead of doing like the long format conversations, like I mentioned to you, um, I want to invite you guys on like you and Paul and Steve and Celso and all you guys have you guys on. Um, or like five, 10 minute clips. Like we'll talk about like the news mm. of the day in like a short little bit um, and just kind of get it in there. So I'm going to be doing that like once a week. So I'm going to have you guys going, hey, are you free this week? Cool. You're going to be on, you know, Thursday or something. Then we'll figure that out. So yeah, the formatting that I have in mind is uh, I really like it. I'm, I think I'm going to shoot a pilot and have uh, the patrons and you guys take a look at it and kind of give me your feedback and Once I feel it's up to snuff, uh, I'll be rolling that out soon. You know, one thing I'll say is it's very hard. I mean, I have the Die Shrink podcast I do for patrons. I I guess I also just started Hits and Gems, which I have for patrons as well. (laughs) Those will probably drop in the free feed eventually. But then I also have to get a Broken Silicon out every Wednesday and I'm rebooting Flyover States. It's like, but if you have like, yeah, like you notice a video I made or Paul made or someone and it's something you want to talk about in the a daily news thing. And you're like, Tom, are you free? Not for an hour, but for 10 minutes, just 10 minutes. I could easily, I think that'd be very easy to get a lot of tech tubers to quickly call in and almost like a news show fashion and give their take on things. That's a, it's an interesting idea. Yeah, that, that's kind of the format that I'm thinking. And like, for example, uh, Steve from Hardware Unbox, like maybe he'll put out like a review or something and I might want to write in his comment section, I'll be like, be great if I can get him on here, ask him those questions and get maybe like deeper analysis because he's got all the 
the cool gizmos as soon as they come out. So that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Or like you said, if you have an interesting video, get your take immediately. So instead of having to respond to all those comments, maybe get the big questions out of the way type of thing. Yeah, not all of us get 64 core processors sent to us like uh, Steve at Hardware Unbox does. That's true. Well, that's why we rely on people like Steve. It's like, let us know how that really works out for you. Well, yeah, and, and I guess I want to get to the main subject, but I just, I guess since we, I brought it up just now, I'll, br I'll say, uh, I mean, again, you know, the 64 core 3990X, it games fine. There's no, it, Zen 2 truly is incredible. I'm just saying it again. I know I probably said it too many times, but like just saying like, yeah, it has no weaknesses and it has 64 cores. Like, I don't know how many people understand how that's just, that wasn't a thing before. Even with Intel HEDT processors, they would have substantial boost clock losses that you just you just don't see any weaknesses with Zen 2. It's, in, it's insane. Yeah, no, it, it's crazy. And things are just accelerating because, I mean, if I'm right about where Zen 3 is going to be, next year we're all going to be like, man, Zen 3 is freaking crazy, like talking just the same way. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. And I think it's going to get faster and faster and faster. And people just aren't going to be able to keep up with how exponential things are going. But that kind of ties into what we're going to be talking about more on the GPU side. Uh, so if you want to go back over kind of that video, the MX350 video, to kind of set up how that conversation started. Where I would actually start is when I saw Zen 1, I was impressed. And then I saw the Zen 1 APUs and I was like, wow, I don't know if NVIDIA has got a place in this market anymore. But then right in the beginning of 2017, they launched the MX150. And I remember, you know, I was pretty much at peak NVIDIA hate at that point. So to impress me and be NVIDIA... Is a big deal. I mean, I think at that time I still had even a, yeah, I still had a MacBook Air, which had a Broadwell APU. So I was all not NVIDIA by then, but I looked at this thing and they were like, no, it really has a 10 watt version. It really is just 74 millimeters squared. And at that size, at that power usage, it can share a heatsink with the new KB Lake R quad core i7s coming out for laptops. And I went, so wait, so if it doesn't even really need its own heatsink, well, I guess, I guess NVIDIA flipped the script then. I guess if they can just make something still 50% better, or eventually it was just 20%, but it, it's, it's there, that much better than an AMD APU, I guess we'll keep using NVIDIA graphics cards and laptops. And it doesn't really lose battery life if you're not gaming. If you are gaming, you don't have as much heat density and it gets like a 20, 30% boost. And so, yeah, I mean, if NVIDIA can keep doing this, it's great. And then they released the MX250 and like late 2018 or something, whatever. And I ended up through bad luck having to get a new laptop and that had an MX250. And that thing was, again, you know, 20, 30% better. I mean, okay, so again, they've made something that is just that little bit better than Zen Plus APUs. You know, it was a year and a half life for the MX150. A year and a half later, so late 2019, I expect an MX350 that's maybe Turing-based. That would be awesome. And it just never happened. And I think that's what you said in the YouTube comments, that they just didn't think they needed it, I guess. And no, now, no. And it was very clear that they, they felt that refreshing again was going to be good enough. Otherwise, they wouldn't have launched the thing. Yeah, and if you look at what the MX350 is rumored to be, it's like, a, it's a, I think, GP107. So that's the 1050, 1050 Ti core. And that's 150 millimeter squared. So that's twice as big. So I don't know that you'll fit that in all of the same laptops. But, you know, it's smaller than the uh, GTX 1650. And that thing is 200. 200 millimeter squared, guys. 20% smaller than a 5700 XT. Turing is not small. But, you know, if they would have made a G, uh, a TU-118, you know, what could have been sold as a GT-1630 and the MX-350 Turing-based, I think they could have still made something that with like either 384 to 512 Turing cores that would have been only a little bit bigger than the MX-250. And that certainly would have fit in all the same laptops. And, you know, going from 384 Pascal cores to 512 Turing cores, and then just giving it a 64-bit interface, well, that's, you know, you can put a 4-gigabyte GDR6 chip on there. Just one 4-gigabyte GDR6 chip that doesn't take up a lot of space would be the same bandwidth of the 128-bit, or they also have a 96-bit version too, GTX 1050 or 1050 Ti. And so I just don't, I just such a profound missed opportunity to release something smaller than the 1050 Ti 
same performance that probably would have used half the energy and had the same bandwidth. I mean, that would have sold. You know, the GT1030 sells. It sells a lot. And not updating that is such a bizarre oversight. So I guess before we move on with this statement, I guess, do you have anything you want to say to all of that I just said? (laughs) Um, Well, as I mentioned in the comment section, I mean, it's very clear that it just wasn't worth the investment cost to NVIDIA. Well, they didn't think it was. They, they they ran their numbers and said, not worth it. Let's just, you know, use a slightly larger Pascal chip, which is, you know, cheap as anything for them to make right now. Uh, hell, they might just have extras laying around and said, just sell them off as a new product. It's fine. Which is what I thought, too, because they don't really sell 1050s anymore. They only sell 1050 Ti. So I'm like, oh, well, they're just going to take these cut down chips. They don't even bother selling anymore and use it for this, probably. More than likely. And it's to flush out old inventory because, you know, the new graphics cards are coming out this year sometime. Mm -hmm. Um, We don't know that for sure. But I mean, according to NVIDIA's normal timelines, it should come out this year at some point. And I think this generation, kind of like how Maxwell wasn't very big, if you think about it. I mean, that started at the 950 and then it went up to, uh, you know, the 980 Ti. They didn't really have super low end stuff. They kept the 750 Ti, which was Maxwell, but it was kind of like, the initial one. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's what Turing feels like to me. It's not like a full fleshed out lineup. Yeah. And Pas- Pascal was. That was top to bottom, all Pascal. And I think they're going to do that again with this next revision of graphics cards. So I figured they they just said, screw it. We'll just wait until we do that. Yeah, I mean, that's probably what they did. But and I just think they left a huge opening, you know, that they didn't think would be there. And I don't, and I really think people, both Intel and NVIDIA, and even me, I mean, I thought Renoir would be good, of course, but, you know, I think there was that wondering, you know, will they really go to eight cores? I thought they probably would, but we weren't sure. Will they really get this efficiency down? And, you know, I've seen from people who work at Intel that they, like, I've been told, though, they really did not think Renoir would be this good. They looked at the you know, even the, I don't know, like a, an R5 or I guess, right, is it R5 or R7? I think R7 3700X. And they said, you know, that thing still uses 65 watts. It has this IO die and everyone gets caught up on this chiplet thing that AMD is doing. And it's like, well, Zen's just a good architecture. It doesn't need to use chiplets. And then here comes Renoir 150 millimeter squared. By the way, Renoir's entire APU the size of what the MX350s die will be by itself. And that thing looks like it will probably be pretty close to the same performance while also having a built-in eight-core CPU. I really think people underestimated how good Renoir was going to be. And with that coming out, I mean, look, the MX330 is a rebranded 250. It's useless. That thing is useless. Even cut down Renoir will probably outperform its graphics in a cheaper package. and. The MX350, it might be stronger. We're going to have to see, but depends how much they have to TDP it down. I don't, I don't think it'll, it'll probably be better because uh, if they use a 128 bit memory bus, it'll probably be faster. But if they lower it to 96 or definitely if they go down to 64, yeah, which I probably not. Um, but they wouldn't. Obviously, they'll use the 128 bit bus if they're competitive. They're going to be like, we need to go all out so we can sell these things. If they, um, that's unless they think they have to fit it in the same form factors, because the MX250 150 has a single 64 bit right bus, so that you only have to add one two gigabyte GDR5 chiplet. Now, if you have to all of a sudden add two, well, uh, it takes up more space. So I wonder well, if that's why they would go to 64 bit, actually. Yeah, if space is the problem, then obviously they're kind of screwed on it, or they might have the option you can go one way or the other. Also, using 128-bit memory bus consumes more power, which yeah. will then also cause even more problems. But they're going to need that performance. So. That's why I suspected 96-bit. Um, but uh, I don't know. I could honestly see it going either way. Like you say, I could see it going to 128-bit, and they say, hey, look, the MX330 is the replacement truly to the 250, and it is just 20% better again. But again, I say I, I look at that and I'm like, well, that's useless because cut down Renoir is better than that thing. And then I look at the MX350 and I go, I guess if they just make the laptop slightly bigger, it will be stronger if they give it 96 bit or higher for sure, I guess. But it needs it also for three gigabytes of RAM. So that's just how I look at it. It's like, well, they're still being pushed out of these form factors. Like, you know, I'm holding it up. This 
this. This is smaller than my MacBook Air, and it has this graphics card. If you can't fit the MX350 in this, I'll lose the 20% performance to keep this form factor personally. But if they then go with a 64-bit bus so they can just keep the same form factor, it's not going to outperform Renoir, I don't think. And that's why I just kind of see it as screwed either way. And again, that was my thesis. Like, I understand they had reasons for doing it, but I just think not making a TU-118. They've created... If they get pushed out of this high-volume you know, slim laptop market, it might be hard to get back in there because Zen 3 is going to be a lot better. And I don't know how you just get back into that, you know, high volume market. I understand there's not high profit margins, but it is high well, volume. The thing is, is they're not going to be, let, let's say even they get blown out of the water, nobody wants them. Let's say it's irrelevant. No manufacturers want it. It's only going to be for a few months, maybe a year. So yeah, that But then Zen 3 all- rolls out. Yeah, but they're already expecting to compete with Zen 3. Remember. We knew a long time ago that Renoir was going to have Vega. See, the thing is, they didn't realize it was going to be Vega Plus or whatever the hell they did Mm -hmm. to it. Yeah, that too was a surprise. Exactly. So they're like, we can beat Vega. We're already beating Vega. So they weren't too worried about it, I would assume, uh, because we all knew that. So that was probably what it was. So they're already expecting to compete with Navi next generation. So now, unless it's like some sort of uh, like RDNA 2 or 3 or something that nobody can predict, uh, you know, nobody can predict that. So, but I think that they're they're planning on competing against something much stronger next time. But that's probably also why they want to wait until they get to seven nanometers, so they get all the added benefits. And you know, they definitely for- wanted to wait for the full lineup because they know whatever they make on seven nanometers is going to be significantly better than a TU one eighteen. Although, again, I still I don't know, I'm just such a dork too. I just wish we could have seen a TU one eighteen because it would have been cool. <laughs> I mean, I mean, Tom, if you want to float the millions of dollars that it takes to make that mask, I'm sure they'll make it for you, buddy. Bitcoin is still not quite to where I'm a billionaire. So <laughs> as a joke, everyone, it's not quite to where I'm even a we, we won't get into how much money it's not. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> no, a billionaire. No, no. I'm not a millionaire. <laughs> Just to be clear. But so this mistake, though, this not expecting the Vega, uh, I guess what what would, what's really a new generation of GCN that snuck up out of nowhere is what's in Renoir, really, mm-hmm. if you think about it. And what's but the, but AMD surprised us with this, and they'll surprise us again. One of the interesting things about Renoir's Vega is they say because I just assumed it was because of like higher boost speeds on seven nanometer, which is most of that performance increase, sure. But they said there is like a twenty to thirty percent efficiency gain from architecture changes they did it's apply. all from memory it's all from memory compression memory is the biggest problem for for apus so well they said there's something with boosting algorithms too i'm sure clocks have something to do with it but i think i said it in the comment section uh like a vega 8 versus a vega 11 that we have now on the current apus mm-hmm. there's very little difference the vega 11's maybe five percent ten percent faster meanwhile it has what 45% more stream processors. Main mm-hmm. reason for that is, is even with high speed DDR4 and desktops, it's just not fast enough for the Vega 11 to stretch its wings completely. That's probably why they went back to the 8 and then just revised oh, yeah, most, for sure. most of the memory architecture. Um, I'm assuming that's where most of this performance is from, is just being infinitely more efficient than the other Vega. Well, yeah, and they said that the a lot of the things in this are not in RDNA 1.0 and that they have been applied to the RDNA 2 architectures coming out, both in the consoles and in Big Navi, which here finally gets us to the main subject, right? Which is, I mean, right there, I assume there's going to be a 10, 20% IPC increase. They've got substantially larger die sizes. And if they fix their efficiency, they could really... They they could challenge NVIDIA, I think, more than people expected. Now, th- now this is my prepared statement, so I'm just going to read it now <laughs> since I typed uh, it up. <laughs> but Have the floor, sir. Yes. So before we talk about anything in depth about what we think about Big Navi, there are really two things that I just want to establish at the onset. First of all, AMD is not weak or incapable of in- competing. In fact, even when the company was at their overall near weakest in history, they managed to dethrone the Titan with the 290X that cost half as much. The 290X was not some loss leader either. It had a smaller die size, 
And it probably costs quite a bit less to manufacture. Now, in hindsight, I think they should have given it a nicer fan and sold it for 600 But, you know, either way, AMD won in performance and efficiency that gen, even if consumers didn't reward them by buying their chips, because they really didn't. But before that, the 7970 one, the 5870 one, I think it's fair to argue the 4870 and 6970 were better than the NVIDIA flagships at the time, even if weaker. But when I look at Renoir right now, literally, literally cannot make a car that efficient. Well, unless they spent a substantial amount more money out of nowhere. But for the most part, they just can't even compete with that now. And AMD chose to release the 5700 XT first. They chose to release the 6870 before the 6970, just like the fifth, you know, that's the same story. AMD chooses to release what they want to. They have limitations, but that my main point is if they choose to compete in the high end, I think they just will more than people think. And that like AMD is capable of competing and they could have with a big Polaris card, which frankly only showed up in the Xbox One X and all of that stuff. And most losses, and this is my second point. So basically the first point is AMD can compete when they want to. They've done it before when they had less money. And number two, most losses, the more you look at it are like logistical failures. It's not because they screwed up an architecture. When you look at Bulldozer, now, that was a screwed up architecture, but the 30, the botched 32 nanometer also really, really made it much worse than it should have been. And Global Foundry's inefficient 14 nanometer did not help Polaris or Vega. And then look at Intel's 10 nanometer. A lot of these losses, like Intel right now, like Ice Lake's a great architecture. It's a logistical failure that stranded Intel on 14 nanometer. And a big problem for NVIDIA right now is their inability to migrate their old way of doing things onto 7 nanometer, I think as soon as people expected them to. Now, I didn't think they were going to launch 7 nanometer cards till late 2020, and that still kind of looks like that's true, but I don't know. I think people underestimate AMD's ability to choose to compete when they want to, and people underestimate how many failures are logistical, and I see some big potential logistical failures for NVIDIA right now, moving from 12 to 7 nanometer. All right, I just said a lot. I don't know if you want to respond to any of that. <laughs> All righty. Well, I mean, you know how critical I am about AMD's marketing, which I, I would attribute logistical issues as part of that. It's just failure to get the product to the people properly type of a thing. And that is one of their largest weaknesses. And I've done tons of videos on that. So I agree. And they can make a good product. But I will say this, that AMD have been behind technologically until our DNA came out. Um, Polaris was worse than Pascal. I mean, technologically, just yeah. works. I mean, there's there's no there's arguing no way that. around that. Yeah. No, and Nvi Nvidia was basically a generation ahead, but AMD could still compete. You know, just they had to scale down and compete at lower levels. No big deal. Um, they really screwed up when they decided to make two different segments. I think. I think this is when things really got off the rails for them. Yeah, the 290, 290X, 390, 390X. Those were great. It's when they started going, hey, we're going to make this whole other architecture to be our high end, which mm -hmm. was basically just cut down server, you know, uh, and professional grade GPUs with the uh, with the Fiji. That's when things really kind of started slipping for them, because mm -hmm. now you're trying to optimize code and you're trying to and drivers and stuff for two completely different architectures instead of one unified thing. So I think that really hurt them, and their drivers mm. did suffer for a long time until after Polaris launched, which Polaris was great. And I yeah. remember, sa remember saying that when that came out. I was like, don't buy a GTX 1060. It's going to fall on its face in the future. And lo and behold, I was right. And But then Vega. Vega was hurt by two things. First off, AMD's marketing. Poor Volta. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, they're marketing around Vega. I don't... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did that whole video, which turned out to be my biggest video ever, where I go through all of that. Um, but yeah, they they really hurt themselves with with the marketing on that, and then it just didn't perform. And mm. then you know, Navi came out, and Navi is really good, but once again, it was just the marketing and the fact that they switched up their prices, and they just keep hurting themselves. But yes, if they want to compete, AMD is a market leader. I think I was talking to Paul on Discord, and one of the things that he I tried to stress to him is, is AMD is a market leader now. Yes, they, they really are. I think they need to start acting like it a little more. But I, I think they're starting to. They're positioning they themselves. Are. You know, you can see by their pricing, it's like we're not second tier anymore. We're going to charge an appropriate amount of money for things. 
and they can command it because Intel's been kicked back a lot. You just you started <laughs> off this whole video, sixty four cores. Intel versus many, eighteen. Oh, don't worry, they got two twenty two cores coming soon at four hundred watts. <laughs> Yeah, no. One of the world's largest companies is shaking in their boots and afraid of going out of business right now because of this. You know, they have to compete. And mm. uh, NVIDIA, you know, they're not immune to this as well. But NVIDIA, yes. That's NVIDIA never got complacent. You can't ever say that NVIDIA is like, nah, mm -hmm. they really just sandbagged this generation. Hell no. They want all of that server money. They want to make $30,000, $50,000 GPUs. <laughs> Certainly, and, yes. Yeah, if they could make something, you know, 20 times faster than what they have now, they would and they would charge 100 times more for it. I mean, that's just the way that they they operate as a company. So, that that's the real difference, but yeah, AMD can compete if well, it, they it, so choose. And let me add this too right away. I was going to save this for bringing up later as its own discussion, but I'll just throw this in there now. I give this long-winded speech about how you guys got to stop underestimating AMD. This is not the same company they used to be, and they've done it before when they were weaker. But at the same time, I just, and again, it's basically you just see this with fanboys, but like, don't underestimate NVIDIA either. They've, I agree, they were never complacent, even if I certainly didn't like some of their decisions and choices they made to consumers in the past. They've never been complacent. And that's one of the points of like my Ampere leak analysis video where I'm like, I don't think you all should rule out that Ampere could be this good like like nvidia is I, I you have to assume right that when nvidia looks at what's happening to intel wang's in a boardroom and he's like right now we're on top but we're not fucking letting that happen to us okay guys <laughs> we're not letting that happen to us because amd just did that to intel yeah he's probably got the shark tank ready whoever yeah. lets that happen that's where you're going so i don't underestimate nvidia either i don't underestimate that if they need to they could make a 320-bit, 20-gigabyte, uh, 3080, and drop that at like $800 if they want to. They certainly can. I'm not saying they will. It all depends on if Big Navi isn't a bag of shit. But I, I really wouldn't rule out that they could do that. The, again, the, so that's why the biggest problem I have, though, is when is that actually going to come out, though? And will it be able to produce enough of them? There's a reason to stay on 12 nanometer when you're a company that has most of the market share, so you can keep churning out not hundreds of thousands, or you know, what do they even make? Ten thousand Radeon sevens? No, they need to churn out millions of these cards. So, I guess that's my biggest pro. I, I have no doubt Ampere could be amazing, but again, I, I'm always the person too who just says, "I don't over or underestimate." I I don't know. I, I don't think they're. I don't think they got complacent though. If you put a gun up to my head. No, I, I don't think so. In fact, uh, I personally think this next generation from NVIDIA is going to be another Pascal. This is going to be Turing stripped down back to its bare metal and built for speed. And that's why I mentioned in my video when those leaks came out, 2.5 gigahertz is not off the table for NVIDIA. They've been pushing mm -hmm. 2.1, 2.2 gigahertz for four years. You don't think in a node shrink and four years and two architectures later. And it's later. a matured node by now, too. Exactly. You don't think that hitting 2.5 is, isn't possible? I mean, we weren't expecting two gigahertz plus from Pascal when, you know, was it 1.4 is kind of where Maxwell was? It was a 600 megahertz bump. That was pretty crazy. So I'm thinking that's going to be more the route that they go. And if that's the case, imagine 60 SMs at that speed. Well, and again, that's also why I think a lot of people looked at the leaked Ampere dyes. Like there was, I think, what was it? It was like GA103. I think that was the one that was. That's the weird one. That was yeah. the 320-bit one. And they're like, well, that's, you know, here they go. Now it's only 320-bit for the 3080 Ti. And look, that could definitely be true. It could be true. They could be going to a 20 gigabyte 3080 Ti that they want to charge $1,500 for. You know, if Big Navi doesn't perform, <laughs> that's probably what's going to happen. But at the same time, when you look at like the 2080 Super to the 2080 Ti, it's like a 20% difference and it's almost all down to bandwidth. So there would be a reason they would say, you know, we're not going to add that many more CUDA cores. Maybe now we're up to you know, 5,000, 5,100. But we're going to clock this to 2.5 gigahertz, and we're just going to do a massive bandwidth increase across the entire lineup. I think that's a pretty logical thing to assume they might do instead of adding more cores. 
I that's kind of part of my thought, but I don't think the TI is going to be the GA one hundred three. That's going to be the X eighty. The big problem that's is what I is, think. Yeah, I do think yeah. that one hundred three is the X eighty. Yeah, the three twenty bit is just to overcome the limitations of GDDR six. I was also talking to Paul about this. GDDR is the worst thing holding graphics cards back. AMD, because mm-hmm. of their memory compression being less sophisticated than NVIDIA's. NVIDIA does have better memory compression, so they can get away with less bandwidth. That's why like AMD needs a 384 bit or HBM to compete against, you know, their 256. Uh, that's just kind of the way that it has been going traditionally. But anyways, that's the reason why they need the 320 bit on the X80 to get that level of performance to overcome the limitations of GDDR mm-hmm. because HBM's too expensive. The only option is bigger memory bus or go ahead and use HBM. And they, they just can't afford the cost because they want those margin dollars is really what it is. The 384 bit will be the TI class yeah. and that'll be even higher. And again, maybe they'll go with 10 gigabytes for the 3080. That certainly wouldn't surprise me. But it wouldn't surprise me if they had a 20 gigabyte, if they actually let the AIBs you know, kind of run wild this gen. And the reason I say that is, look, I think the PS5 at a minimum is going to have 20 gigabytes of RAM total. I think that's at least 16 gigs of GDR6 and then 4 gigabytes of DDR4 for the background tasks and apps. And if you look at that then... Do you like if you're Nvidia and I don't know, right? But if you're Nvidia, do you really want to let Sony and then Microsoft walk out and be like this $500 console has more memory than the 3080? I don't know that you want to be able to give, you know, I don't know if you want that perception. And and again, I don't know that they will do this if big Navi fails, but that's also why I wouldn't rule out giant memory sizes and also just from a real politic point of view if these next-gen consoles are going to have so much memory, a lot of games are going to be built to use more than 8 gigabytes of RAM. Well, of course they will. You know, once those start going, real next-gen games aren't kicking off. And I've said this to you before. Microsoft's even said it, but they're not kicking off till 2022, 2023 anyway. So you don't need to worry about it till then. That's why I think you're right. Offering, let's say, a 10 and 20 gigabyte model Mm. or an 8 and 16 gigabyte model, I guarantee you they're going to do it again because... The 8 and 10 gigabytes are fine for now. And then if you want to spend the extra money and not upgrade, you you can get away with that. It's just like the 2 gigabyte, you know, 680 uh, mm-hmm. way back when, or they had the 4 gigabyte model. Which one still can be used today? The 2 gigabyte <laughs> yeah. model is useless. It's useless, you know? yeah. I mean, it exactly. loses to a 7870 even now, I think, which is funny to think back on. But um, I actually got a reader mail here. Let me bring this up to move the conversation a little bit. So Alec Williams writes in and he says, do you think AMD intentionally is planning to over manufacture on TSMC 7 nanometer to keep NVIDIA, and then he puts in parentheses, or possibly Intel from advancing to that node as much as they already can? Because I think that's an interesting argument too, that I think that surprised some people when AMD bought up all that capacity. I don't think it's specifically to keep the competition out. I I think NVIDIA has always been looking at Samsung. And I think uh, last thing I read that there were some problems with yes. that actually, and there are. Oh, yeah. Well, no surprise to me, at least in my opinion, that Samsung hasn't caught up with it. TSMC. It always to me seemed like I always saw that on roadmap. So, well, Samsung seven nanometer EUV launching in like three months, and I'm like, mm, I don't know. For some reason, my gut tells me it's not Samsung. I don't know if I believe you. Right. Yeah, I thought it was a little strange as well, but. Uh, AMD's got a really tight partnership with TSMC. Do, TSMC yeah. looks at AMD as their Intel, essentially. It's like, hey, you're bringing that same level of clout to our product. So, and attention. They bring tons of attention to TSMC. And uh, so, yeah, obviously, they, they really like having them there. So, they're definitely going to give them everything that they need. But no, AMD needs all the seven nanometer. Mm-hmm processing that they have. I mean, they're ramping up so fast. I mean, they're still selling, what was it, uh, Zen Pluses. You know, they're ramping up the 1600 AF, you know, just because it's like, hey, we're still selling these on these old nodes. And Mm -hmm. I don't know why they named it that, but they can always stack older technology and older products just at cheaper price points and people will buy it. Yeah, and I think something, um, a point I've brought up multiple times, never like done a video specifically on this, but it's something I'd like to talk about when I can is keep this in mind too, that it really behooves TSMC to make AMD take as much market share as possible over the next three years, both because, you know, 
if you're a TSMC, AMD is a potential mega, mega long-term buyer. I mean, I already think of AMD as a market leader, right? But like what they literally became a market leader, that's all money going to TSMC. So they want AMD to hurt Intel as much as possible for obvious reasons. And even maybe a little bit with NVIDIA, it doesn't help TSMC if there's a monopoly in the graphics space, right? It doesn't help them if NVIDIA is destroying AMD. They want an even battlefield in all markets, or if not a slight win in the CPU market, so that the AMD's got more money to pay them more money. Oh, yeah. It's in TSMC's best interest that AMD becomes Intel. Yeah. So I wouldn't surprise me if they gave them some decent deals and like allowed them to have a lot of capacity next to Apple, just because it's like, well, Apple's just going to buy the same amount of phones every year. They're just focusing on raising prices and software now. So, but AMD is growing, and if we uh, if we can make them a juggernaut, God, we'll just make so much damn money. Which again is a thing where it's like I almost, I worry. I think Samsung sees the writing on the wall, and that's why they're going to go throw over a hundred billion dollars at new foundry research. But like, if the other foundries aren't careful, which when I say other, I mean there's basically just Intel, Samsung, and Global at this point, uh, at least anywhere near the same level of performance then, I mean, we could see a situation where it's runaway profits for TSMC too, where, yes, at first, they only had so much 7 nanometer capacity. Yes, at first, it was more expensive, but they also were making more money. And, you know, with more money, you can build more foundries and just outcrowd the weaker nodes other people are making. I'm kind of changing the subject a little bit, but... I, I mean, it all kind of ties together. I mean, that that's more big picture. But yeah, mm-hmm. no, the, I, I agree. I think at the end of the day, the fear of something like TSMC becoming such a monopoly through a company like AMD, that that's a real fear that I have. I mean, I, monopolies, diopolies, you know, when, when you don't have real competition, mm-hmm. which you and I both talk about, that's not good for anybody. Because let's say it, TSMC pretty much takes over. Let's say mm-hmm. AMD kills Intel, they're out of the just business. Just kills them. Let's say that happens. Just kills them. They're, they're done, uh, which won't happen. But I don't think just so. Just in this hypothetical example, I mean, uh, you know, then it's just Samsung will probably buy NVIDIA at that point. And then that, that's, <laughs> that's really, that's really it. And that's, you mean just buy Intel? Those, not, uh, pretty, no, I, I mean, maybe know. you mean but, either or. I don't know. I mean, long term, which company has more value? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'd rather. Yeah, I don't know. Actually, that's an interesting question, too. Maybe I would rather. I, don't, I actually don't know. I guess right now I'd rather own Intel, actually. Uh, I'm actually right, more... right now. I would, yeah, but you know, if AMD stomps them through the floor, let's say they can't get anything going for the next five years, it, mm-hmm. would you still want Intel over Nvidia? Um, and well, that's why I said right now. In five years, yeah. I don't know. I, I I will say I'm also skeptical of Nvidia to a certain extent. It's there. It, it's just if they ever screw up their gaming hegemony, I just really think people underestimate how much that means they've screwed up everything. I mean, I know they like to pretend AI is a thing and they like to pretend they're working on quantum, but their moneymaker is gaming. If they lose gaming, I I don't see any really... I I mean, this is where we're getting into opinion. I'm not stating this like it's a fact. It is my opinion that this is an AI bubble we're in right now. There are some very real uses for it, but I think... uh, I don't... Uh, <laughs> NVIDIA is making money from gaming, I guess is what I'm saying. If they screw well, that yes. up, I'd rather own... Yeah, so I guess I'm saying, and if they screw that up, I'd rather own Intel. Well, well, that was actually part of our conversation was is uh, how precarious the position is for mm. NVIDIA. We, we, we know how precarious it is for Intel. It's very obvious, but people don't realize that NVIDIA is not in as strong a position as people think. Like you said, they're not going to be the leaders in AI. Mm. Um, there, every tech so. company in the world is dumping money into this, even startups and garages. Mm-hmm. Somebody's going to do it better than them. Just going to happen. So that's not really going to be their bread and butter long term. Gaming is their thing. They are the only GPU manufacturer on the planet. AMD is a CPU manufacturer that happens to make graphics cards. Same thing with Intel. NVIDIA is the only one where GPU is the primary breadwinner. So... How long is that going to be viable with how fast technology is advancing? And Mm -hmm. this ties into Renoir. How long are average consumers like you, me, and the people listening to this going to even need discrete graphics cards? 
it, it's one of those things where, yeah, I mean, me and you have talked about this before. I mean, I think APUs will eventually be the future. And I think people get mad and just try to throw poop right away. Because I think they think that means it's the death of do-it-yourself, which they, it might change. But I just, I wouldn't assume it is. I mean, you know, the way, if you, I did, that was one of my first videos is the changing, like, amount of components needed in a PC. I, I If you go back to, like, the early 2000s, and look at like a do-it-yourself PC website. They're like, it's, it's honestly hilarious. It's like, here's our here's our network adapter card. Here's our sound card. Here's our video card. Here's our 2D video card. Here's our CPU. Here's our motherboard power supply. Here's our RAM sticks. And then, I mean, like you have like- Well, then um, you had your CD-ROM. Then you had to connect the CD-ROM yeah. to the sound card. Then you, yeah, it, and now it, it's just it was graphic, a lot more complicated. Right? It's just graphics card, motherboard, RAM, processor, well, that's really it. So then, of course, there's the obvious things like a case and cooling. But I'm saying in core components, we're just basically down to like three or four things. And look, I, I could just see a world where there's just the motherboard, the SOC, and then you pick what type of RAM you want. Like, and that's it. That's all you need to choose. And there will even, of course, be situations where you don't even need to choose more than the motherboard. <laughs> like, it just uh, has everything built in. Exactly. And the CPU will have everything on there once we start getting... 3D stacked uh, DRAMs. Yeah. I mean, you might not even need memory modules anymore. They might still have or, expansion or so slots. St some people will, but I just wouldn't. And I guess my point, though, I was making too, is I wouldn't assume it's so bad for do-it-yourself because, and again, I, this is hypothetical. I'm not saying this will happen, but like, why are we so sure things will just go into these like weak APUs in the future? Like, I could see a situation where it's like, hey, this is the, you know, they don't even call it the RX 5500 graphics card or processor. They're like, this is the, RX, you know, 9900. It's a APU. What it has is a graphics core that we think is well balanced with the 32 core or whatever they have by then right in it. And, and the graphics card is this strong because that's what we think graphics you would get with this processor. It's already what they do with APUs. And then they say, you know, maybe there's HBM built in, but if you play in really high resolutions, you can expand the memory with this you know, uh, ra these RAM sticks that also double as storage. And then, but if you don't need that, you don't need to get it, you know, and everything would be faster because all the core memory is integrated. And I just wouldn't assume it'd be almost like choosing your memory type. Like, oh, I'm a gamer, so I don't need to add more than a couple sticks of GDR7 or honestly, GDR will probably be gone by then or whatever. But then maybe you're a render person and you're like, no, 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 I need a lot of RAM and a lot of bandwidth. So I'm going to pay huge money for HBM sticks of memory. And it wouldn't be HBM by how we think of it now in the future. But you get my point though, right? Just like choosing an SOC and then the memory. Sure. I mean, that could be a way that it goes. Um, I mean, HEDT is never going to go anywhere. Servers no. are never going to go anywhere, which HEDT is just cut down server stuff. So, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's why that'll always be there. And for those people that need all that crazy processing power and 64 cores, you know, here today, you know, you can go out and get that. But for the average consumer, I look at something like the Raspberry Pi. See, everybody is so worried about this customizability. I'm thinking more about, you know, just the fact that you could buy it at 60 bucks, you buy it, and then a year later, yeah. another one comes out, you throw it in the garbage and you buy another one for $60. You know, it's just this cheap little thing. And the video that I did yesterday and with how fast AI and the crazy stuff that we can already do, it's not out of this world to think that AI will be good enough. Actually, I have proof that it is good enough that it can take a very low resolution image, mm -hmm. even something like 720p and upscale that to 8K and make it look as good, if not better than native. So you don't actually need anywhere near the amount of horsepower that you need now. You would just need the AI acceleration, which will eventually be built into CPUs, I believe. Have you heard of the company AdSure? Negative. So this is a ray tracing uh, FPGA ASIC company that also, it's not just that they are working on FPGAs and ASICs for ray tracing. They're also working on just good algorithms for doing it. And this is something that... Uh, <laughs> it's actually part of like a big PS5 video I've been putting together. I just haven't got around to. And they've said they are working on chips for consoles that will come out in the next year. We also know that Sony said there's a lot of rumors Sony may put in an a ray tracing ASIC. Now, if you go back and you look at the demos they've done, they're a very small startup of that out of um, Israel, actually. 
So I, I, I'm I'm skeptical this is actually going into any PlayStation because I just don't know if the company's capable or big enough yet. But the demos they've shown so far are incredible. It's like they'll hold up a tablet and you point it at a table, kind of like what you do with like, I don't know, all those AR things on games and uh, apps and gimmicks on smartphones. And they just made the tablet look at the table and then it made stormtroopers appear and start dancing. And then they were perfectly ray traced. And they were able to do this in real time at 40 frames per second with a tablet, SOC. And I think the real implication of this that people aren't think that a lot of people miss was well, it's not just that they fit ray tracing onto an eight core, you know, tablet. It's also that they did this in AR. They didn't need to pre render anything. They didn't need a lot of horsepower to just go, hey, there's a scene in front of us. We added ray tracing in post. So you could see a future where there's like a ray tracing chip that just adds it to any game in post, right? Kind of like what you're talking about with AI upgrading old games. You could also have an algorithm know how to ray trace. Like this is a mirror. It knows what a mirror looks like, even in a PS1 grade graphics game. And it just says, this is water. The algorithm can tell they were trying to render water in the past. And they just add a ray tracing effect in post to old games. Yeah, and that's basically what the future is probably going to be. Just looking at what NVIDIA is pushing out there and what kind of the overarching narrative is, you take a look at everything that people are talking about. I mean, it's AI, it's ray tracing. Those are going to be the future. And I would make the argument, I actually got a lot of blowback because I was talking about ray tracing in that video. (laughs) Basically, I was explaining how you can run low resolution and it'll look fine. So ray tracing is not going to hurt your performance. But Ray tracing is the only way to make games look significantly better than they do now. There's no more hackery and trickery that these companies can do to make games look better with traditional rasterization. Because if they could, they would be doing that instead of learning a whole new process and implementing new stuff. That's just the way that business works. If they can do something cheaper and easier, they're always going to choose that. So the only reason why ray tracing is going to be the next thing is because they have to do it. It's the only way to make games look better. And like you said, they're going to find ways to make this work. And I I think the next step, too, is certainly not what NVIDIA did, which is just try to get you to buy an expensive card that can't run games past 30 frames in ray tracing. I think the first solution is something we're likely to see on the next-gen consoles, where they're like, well, look, this can do so many gig arrays, and it's fixed-function hardware, so all all of the... you know, game studios and devs know just how much they can get away with because everyone has the same hardware and they'll say, no, (laughs) we're not going to ray trace the guns in Battlefield 6. Like, what a waste of resources. But what we can do is allocate enough resources with this dedicated ray tracing component here to just ray trace mirrors, to just ray trace water. And if you only applied it to that effect in every game, it would look next-gen graphics just ray tracing mirrors in water alone, I think. Like, And I think one of the big problems they have with RT on Turing right now is they're just over ray tracing everything. Like, to, you know, the hardware on Box found they were technically ray tracing like the dull metal on the side of a tank, which isn't really worth it more than just adding a cheap, almost no performance hit rasterization glow on the side of the tank when there's fire around. Like that uses way less resources. So I think that's the first step. But yeah, long term, I think ray tracing is, well, it's it's the obvious final destination. It's just going to take a few generations to get there. I actually disagree. I think next generation, they're not just going to do this hybrid ray tracing crap. It's going to be 100% ray trace. Like Like uh, on next, so you think the next gen consoles will be capable of that? Yes. Yes. Um, Now, the only way that they can do that is, so for example, we're pretty sure that the Xbox Series X is going to be somewhere around uh, 2080 Ti, 2080 Super, 2080 Ti. And rasterization performance, I think it's fair to say they're both around there. We have no idea what the, uh, you know, the ray tracing is. Uh, I'm just going to throw that out. Oh, I know. I know. That's why I still can't confirm if Azure has been working with Sony. They say they're putting something in a next-gen console. And we still see no confirmation of, well, we still don't know. We just know it's going to have it. Right. (laughs) I agree. It's a complete black box still. We don't know. But this is what uh, NVIDIA tried doing is they wanted to launch the ray tracing with the AI. The problem is, is their AI didn't work. And unfortunately, ray tracing will not work without AI. Because Mm -hmm. you have to 
you're not going to be able to render high resolution scenes with ray tracing probably ever because once graphical fidelity goes up, you're not going to be able to keep those high resolutions. 4K 60 is not going to be possible on this next generation hardware with fully ray traced scenes. Mm -hmm. The AI is going to be the key. So they're either going to not do ray tracing at all, I think, or they're going to do it at much lower resolutions, whether it's 720p, 1080p, whatever. And then the AI will upscale. It's the only way to make that work mm. on current and even near future technology. Because if you take a 2080 Ti and you're rendering, let's say, 720 by 480, that's, that's how much you're rendering out. You can fully ray trace that very, very easily. Now it's sure. up to the AI to take that image and, do and it make well it look and, good. And that would explain yeah. why they would have a separate ray tracing chip on there even just to do that. Like, And that's yeah. all it needs to do. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that's what I think. Now, granted, we still don't know for sure. We though, don't which is know. An, a bit frustrating, frankly. <laughs> but uh, you know, whatever. Right? We're all going to know everything within two months anyway. So the wait's almost over. But I'm per I'm personally really excited to see how that turns out. Currently, I am in the process of breaking down my mining rigs. It's just not profitable anymore, and I want to use some of the spare parts plus a few new ones to build my first benchmarking station. Now, what most people might not be able to guess is that my mining rigs all used windows and ones with legitimate keys. But getting those legitimate keys was a hassle. I was forced to scour eBay and be discerning and making sure that the people selling those $10 windows keys weren't a scam. And sometimes the keys didn't work and I had to fight for my money back. But you don't have to if you go to CDK Offers. Go to cdkoffers.com and use the promotional code Broken Silicon to get 25% off an already cheap list price of Windows 10 Professional. Then all you do is click on your email account, go to User Center, and then My Purchase Orders to get the code. Just use this code with a normal download of Windows 10 Professional from Microsoft's website. All right, links in the description. Well, let me sure. let me ask this reader mail here. Uh, Sandro Everts asks, "Do you think using separate ray tracing accelerators will be a thing?" Like, I have a fifty seven hundred XT, and I would love to consider just getting a ray tracing add on card if it worked well. Possibly. Um, it depends how fast it needs to interact with the GPU because PCIe mm -hmm. may, might not have the bandwidth capable enough. Yeah, I think what I would say to that is. If it was a thing, if it was actually a thing where I just buy this $200 card, I don't know that I would do it, I guess, because I mostly use my PC for production at this point. But would I spend $200 if it actually allowed me to go from playing like... Because honestly, I turned down a few settings right now with the Radeon 7, and I can honestly run most games at 4K 100. on like Because there's if you turn it down enough, or maybe I'll put the resolution scale at 80%, whatever. Not that I really game in 4K, but I've tried it, I can. And if I could just add a $200 card that at least let me add, you know, some kind of, like you say, upscaled ray tracing for free, mm -hmm. I might do that. I think that'd be cool. The, the problem I have is this. We're not really seeing that with anything. So like no. th that's my question <laughs> is I have to assume that's for a reason, right? It's not even just about ray tracing. Is Why is there not a physics card? Well, okay, I know NVIDIA bought physics, but... You know, why did no one else try that? Why has no one else tried making a lighting card? I mean, every game is lighting. Why has no one tried just making, uh, you know, and to a certain extent, some of it surprised me, but there has to be a legitimate reason. It just doesn't work well. I kind of assume. Could be wrong, though. Maybe it'll happen. I don't know. I, I mean, that's part of it. I also just think it's, if it's an add-on, most people don't buy the add-on, so then developers mm -hmm. are never going to make games that use it, so yeah. on and so forth. So, so Unless you got and, it into a console or something. Right. But then, I mean, it's integrated. And that's the whole thing is everything's becoming more and more integrated. Mm -hmm. Eventually, like I said, I personally think everything's just going to be on one CPU package. And eventually, they're not even going to have motherboards. Like I said, it's just going to be, here you go. Here's your motherboard. Thing, it's got its yeah. I.O. It's got the CPU. It's got the RAM. Throw it in a case and plug it into the wall and you're done. Um, just because that that's the natural evolution of everything is to get it all together. So add-on cards, I think the day of the add-on card is dead. Look at ITX. Mm. I mean, you even said it. All you need is a GPU and a motherboard. I mean, eventually, you're mm -hmm. not even going to need the GPU. Yeah. And one thing I want to add on to what you just said, because again, so I think some people hear that and they're like, oh, great. We're all going to be 720p APU gamers. No, no, no. It's like, 
eventually, guys, we can't just keep making these things bigger because that's basically... Well, the, C- the Series X is an APU. Let's just throw that out there. Well, yeah, I know it is. I, I know. that's Again, people are like, these weak consoles with AP. I-, I remember that going all the way back to the PS4, just like... I remember in the there was a small ITX gaming build Tom's Hardware did. I don't know why I remember these like this really specific day, but and they had like a seven seven fifty in it, and they were like, yeah, it runs games nine hundred p medium or ten eighty p medium back then, I guess. And I remember people in the comments were like, see how much better PC gaming is. All the consoles have is a tablet APU, and I'm like, well, it's not a normal APU. The PS4's APU is about a 7870. Like they can make these APUs bigger and stronger. And in the future, they're going to have to. They can't just, because there really is a fork in the road here where they can say, we can make four add on cards that crossfire, or we can get massive IPC boosts by 3D stacking. And so it's like, why is the future an APU future? It's not just because it's cheaper and they want to sell you a new device every time, although they certainly don't mind that. I mean, that, that's an added benefit. Let's be Yeah, right. but it's because they have to. They have to, and it doesn't matter if they, if, and that's the real problem you can see in, happening to NVIDIA where it's like, if they keep only making these add-on cards with a thousand millimeters squared, or, you know, it sounds like they're working on Hopper, which might have Chiplets for APUs. I mean, well, I mean, maybe the. I mean, an Epic chip is a thousand millimeter squared equivalent. I think, or around twelve hundred. So, like, maybe Nvidia gets an equivalent chiplet GPU that's like two thousand millimeter squared. Or again, they do something crazy like Cerebrus, where they just do this like that was like a forty thousand or something like that, like forty thousand millimeter squared, like wafer scale die. It's like, yeah, that's one direction you can go. But if you get a one thousand percent IPC increase. By just 3D stacking and making it smaller, it also will use like a lot less energy. Like that's mm-hmm. just the more sensible route in the future. Yeah, I the mean, APUs it, will be faster, guys. It's not APUs today are already great. Like I said, the Xbox Series X. Uh, the only reason why you don't have that on, you know, PC is because we don't have PC motherboards with GDDR soldered on them. Um, there is one in they- China. The, yes, they did. They did make that yeah. the Subaru Z, which I actually thought was really cool. I was thinking about picking it up mm-hmm. um, just for shits and giggles type. I mean, because it's but, curious, right? Like what it would, how it would perform in Windows with just GDR5. Yeah, but I think it uh, was only eight gigabytes, and I'm like, that's not really practical. Uh, if it was 16 gigabytes, because it's both your system memory and graphics mm-hmm. memory, it's like eh, it's a bit limiting. Back to Nvidia, like where I think that they could go in that sort of world is uh, they actually have I don't know if you know about this the uh, Jetson Nano it's basically just the the same chip that they have in their shield tablets it's basically like a Raspberry Pi I can see NVIDIA going that route and basically just using ARM cores and having that be a competitor yeah Yeah, some other CPU architecture other than x86 or uh, you know if things get really desperate they could partner up with Intel and you know then you have the you know the two of them versus AMD. I see that happening as well. But eventually, mm-hmm. that's where the mainstream is going to go. Current mainstream computing as we know it is going to go away. You'll have HEDT, and then most likely it's going to be single board or just single socket, just like really, really small uh, portable devices. And it's all going to be due to the AI because we're going to get to the point where the AI is going to be able to use, do pretty much everything for you. Essentially, you're going to have an AI chip and the game is just going to be running game code and the AI is going to go, oh, this is what you want. And then resolution's not going to matter. Frame rate's not going to matter because it can render anything unlimited, you know, unlimited mm-hmm. resolution. Like you don't need more horsepower for higher res. The AI will be able to do that. And people are like, oh, why do you think it's going to get this good? Because they're expecting AI to control nuclear fission within five years. What's more complicated, up-resing a game or comp- uh, controlling nuclear fission. Uh, I, and then this is where I'll just openly state my opinion that I think people are profoundly overestimating how quickly we're going to get competent AI. I mean, when I look at, I mean, the example I would give. So YouTube says they use, alg- I, I did a video about it, algorithms to determine if a video has questionable material in it. No, they don't. They just flag a keyword. They have a white list. And then someone in Bangladesh says yes or no. That's their algorithm. And if that's what their algorithm is now, I'm just not impressed. I'm not saying this won't be the future that we won't get there. I just I just really doubt the timelines are as aggressive as people think, you know. See, that's the problem is things are things are expected to accelerate so fast 
And I see enough nuggets out there to see that, yes, it's very, very possible. Um, I'll even send you an image that you could put up so people see it. Um, this is the AI remastered Final Fantasy VII. We're talking like stupid. Mm, I think I saw that picture somewhere. Yeah, it's stupid low resolution, 320 by 240 resolution. And you could see the detail that it was able to extrapolate off of that. It doesn't just take what's there and, and make it look shinier. It's not a sharpening filter. It'll actually add detail by going sure, like yeah. how, how your brain does. It's like, this is what it's supposed to look or like. Like that ad sure in the company I was talking about seems to just be able to do. It doesn't even need to right. be a game. They can just look at a table and add a scene and it's ray traced. Right. So yeah, there's there's a lot of nuggets out there showing that it could be happening. So it, it's very hard for people to see that far ahead. Meanwhile, it's only a couple of years, supposedly. So that that's why it's we're kind of in this weird spot but right now. We're supposed now, to have jetpacks by now, too, man. And like, I don't know. <laughs> wow. Yeah, well, if we're going off the movies, yeah, we're supposed to have holograms and all kinds of other fun stuff. But I mean, look, I, they I can't even make a folding phone that doesn't break after five folds. <laughs> and I remember, I guess that's an example I would give, you know, and I, I kind of believed it. Like they said four years ago, oh, pretty soon we're going to have all these folding phones. I remember that Microsoft concept video or like someone like, Holds their phone like on an escalator or something. And it's like, yeah, here we are five years later and uh, they suck. They don't work. I think there's just going to be a lot more work needed than we think. Uh, I, and, you know, and that's before we get into some of these other technologies coming. Again, I think that's a thing. I just don't know that it's happening that quickly. I, I'm, a, I'm a skeptic at this point on a lot of technology. I'll just openly say that. But again, you're, it's like it's all guessing. We don't know for sure either way. Sure, no, nobody knows. I mean, this is just the expected path. Whether it takes five years or 15 years or 20 years, this is where things are going. It's just how fast are we going to get there? Well, so Carbon Cry writes in and he says, how should NVIDIA react to the upcoming next level, quote unquote, APUs from AMD, Renoir, and further, further RDN APUs, implementation of small HBM, DDR5, blah, 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 bodwit, all the bandwidth bottlenecks they might get over. And then, of course, Intel with their Tiger Lake 10 nanometer GPU chiplets, all of this. What do you think NVIDIA's best strategy going forward is? What do you think their actual strategy is going to be? Oh, so what do you, yeah, so Chris, what do you think they should do? What do you think they're going to do? <sighs> okay, well, there's two different ways. I mean, they're going to be pushed out of the mainstream market. What they're probably going to do is go even higher and higher. So they're going to build faster and bigger GPUs. Like we might actually right. see customer grade HBM NVIDIA GPUs. They'll do like two stacks HBM, three stacks HBM, four stacks HBM, and add three or four tiers above the ADTI and just charge two, three, five, ten thousand dollars for them. Mm. They're just going to continue going that route. I do see them doing that because memory bandwidth is one of their biggest limitations. Um, so they could just scale up higher and make bigger and bigger die. They could push up their uh, TDPs, 250 watts, kind of where they keep it now. Maybe they go to 300 or 350. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody wants to go to 350. Yeah, but. I think 400 is definitely the limit. And I think if we're being reasonable, it probably should be 350. <laughs> and that's still a I, lot. For, for me, 300 is kind of pushing it. But, you know, it, if they could get away with charging 10 grand for a 350 watt chip. Sure. They're going to do it. But I think that's what they're going to do. And I do think that they're going to get smart and start looking into, like I said, the, the sort of ARM-based SOCs. I think that there's a big enough market out there if they do it properly. I keep saying it, but look at the Raspberry Pi. This thing has taken mm -hmm. the world by storm. I mean, those sell 10 to 1 for every computer and laptop being sold because they're real cheap. And uh, NVIDIA can make a real competitor to that and charge a little premium. I think theirs is like 40 bucks more. And that's cool, but you get, you know, the NVIDIA graphics card, which is way better. And then for mm -hmm. like people that don't need super computers and are okay with playing older games and stuff, it's perfectly fine. And you get an entire PC for a hundred bucks. I think they'll do that to stay relevant in the super low end, give up kind of that hundred yeah. to two fifty, maybe three hundred dollar range. Look like they already are. Yeah. I mean, the 1650. Non super really kind of shows how much they care about that market. <laughs> yeah, well, and you know, and, and this is something I said to Cortex when we were talking. It we were we were talking about um, like a lot, I see a lot of people say the the x eighty six license is this a roadblock? If like like if Intel gets pushed out, what the hell are we even gonna do? And I I or or vice versa, you know, if AMD focuses on moving to Risk Five and all this other stuff, is Intel's one of Intel's greatest advantages being one of the sole x 
86 people going to be any benefit? And I said, well, there's a chance x86 licenses could be the same as, you know, taxi medallions in the future, to which if any listeners mm-hmm. don't know, I mean, that's honestly, I think, an exact analogy where forever taxi medallions were limited how many you could get in New York City. So I don't remember what it was. I thought, thought it was something like 50,000. There's only this many taxis that can be on the road. And because of that, it was literally speculated on like a stock. Like people would buy and trade them. You'd have four families going together and bid $100,000, I believe, at the Apex 10 years ago for a taxi medallion. And then they would share the taxi car with four families. And that car was always driving. And that taxi medallion was always in use. It was a joint contract. And then overnight, Uber comes and it's gone. And now I believe a taxi medallion in New York is worth like 20 or 10 grand. There's people that paid 10 times that. And I could just... That's how I think of x86 is, look, risk is going to be the standard, I think. Everyone I talked to at Hot Chips, every person, it didn't matter the company. It didn't even matter if it would be good. If it was bad for their company, they still admitted risk five. Anytime, like, what are you most looking forward to? And they're like, risk five. And that's going to open up a bazillion competitors, including NVIDIA, to just make their own APUs and laptops mm-hmm. for customers. And we know how, how much... and. Actually, the, probably NVIDIA's best thing. Like, if you think of NVIDIA as a company, what do you think? Just the first thing that pops in your head. A graphics card. I, I think money-grubbing company. Oh, but okay. <laughs> greedy, money-grubbing company, okay? So, I think Apple. They're very good at building ecosystems. They're mm-hmm. very good at marketing. They're very good at that. So, yes, if they wanted to, and I, I've spoken about the Raspberry Pi all this video. What does that run? That runs Linux. Mm-hmm. What can you run on Risk Five and ARM and anything that's not x86? Linux. So all these kids that are getting these pies, they're already learning Linux. Mm, x86, it's true. It, this x86 is dead. It's dead in 20 years because all the kids today are learning Linux. See, I grew up on Windows. It's just what I'm most comfortable yeah, with. Me too. So I'm just so I we're going to be the. I'm used to it. Yeah, we're old. We're going to be the old people going. I like my Windows. You know. They're all going to use drop it like a bad habit if they make a Linux that actually works well. I'm going to be honest. I mean, look at these Windows updates that just brick thing after brick thing. I don't know. That's a whole other discussion. I I, I will not shed a tear if Windows dies as long as something replaces it. (laughs) But I think we can both agree that x86 is pretty much propped up because of Windows and Windows has a shelf. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've heard some people make counter arguments, um, but it's pretty rare that, that I hear any decent ones. Right. I mean, it's it's going to happen. And once it does, yeah, NVIDIA's, you know, like I said, they're they're smart. They have smart people working over there. They're going yeah. to build up their own chip, and that's why I think something like the Jets and Nano is a really good way for them to get that ball rolling. Um, you see with the Shield TV and stuff, they're kind of getting their own stuff going, but they, they really, uh, with the Jets and Nano, they built their own Linux operating system, their own version of oh, De- Debian or Ubuntu. And once they have that and they start building their own ecosystem, I think they can become the next Apple um, and just kind of make their own products and be their own company. So yeah, I think that they can do it if they want to. If they do do it, I I think that's kind of your answering that question of what that would be the right choice. I mean, like um, I, when I was at Hot Chips, I, they had like some meet and greet thing at one of the days. And one of the guys there I, I, start, I started talking to was like a I don't remember. He did kind of like small scale research at an institution in Germany. And he said, I like AMD and Intel's uh, processors on paper, but he said he actually had the Jensen Nano and that the SDK and the, you know, the development kit for it was just light years ahead of everything. And that's why they ended up using it because it was just, it was just so easy to get up and running, he said. So you yeah. can already see NVIDIA doing this pretty well. Like So like Tommy Spratt writes in and says, well, NVIDIA becoming relevant in the low to mid tier because APUs will be sufficient for, let's say, 4K 120. And I think we kind of answered that. Like, I think personally, yeah. you know, they could become irrelevant in the short term at 1080p gaming APUs, which is a thing. It will be a thing. And there may be a couple of years where NVIDIA doesn't have a, you know, good low end solution. But by the time 4K 120 APUs are here, which I guess you could almost argue the next gen consoles are getting close to that. But I mean, like real ones that you get in laptops. By then, we might really have Risk Five as an option. I don't know. I guess there might be a couple of years where NVIDIA is in a, between a rock and a hard place. But if they play their cards right, I guess pun intended. The best way to answer this question is anything can happen. Notice how we're like, this could happen, this could happen, this could happen. There's so many different options. Yeah, and that's what, and I guess if I had to add on to that, 
what you just said. I would say don't assume it will be worse. Humans screw things up. We're pretty good at it. But also, we typically make things better every 100 years over the previous ones overall. So if we move to APUs or any of this stuff we're talking about, it was, it was for a reason. It was to scale and it performance. it will be better. Yeah. Like, don't assume it's like, oh, again, and I just, oh, it's all going to be esports. I don't know. And I don't even know that the, there might be less customization to a certain degree, but there also might be. So like, if Risk Five becomes the standard, what people need to consider is a future where HP can make their own APU, technically, if they really want to. And then the same operating system can run on that, run on something Dell's working on. Maybe there will be less do-it-yourself processors that go into one socket, but maybe there will be 100 APUs to choose from. You know, I, I don't know right. that it would be so much worse. I'm not sure. I, I mean, once again, anything can happen. And... uh I think that's pretty much the, the best way to look at it is like everybody thinks that change is bad is basically what it comes down to. But <laughs> yeah, you know, change is bad. Change is going to happen whether you want it to or not. And just imagine all the computational power that you need to do whatever you want. Let's, let's just say that they are real cheap, hundred, two hundred dollars mm-hmm. with today's money. You know, you could add for inflation. You know, that's disposable. Okay, it's not upgradable, but you just throw it out or sell it to somebody secondhand like you do with a graphics card. And then spend another two hundred dollars when you need it. I mean, is that really worse than what you have now? No, it's what you have now, but you get everything yeah. Yeah. at one price. <laughs> yeah, I, I and why you would assume it would just go all the bad things? That's not what we've seen happen with most technology. You know, most things have gotten better with these changes. And I guess now, let me. I'm gonna kind of steer it. One more thing, I maybe to add about Nvidia would be just talking about how, like, what would they do that would screw up? And I, I mean, I'll just speak for myself first on this one. I think it would just be doubling down on big cards, proprietary stuff. Because that's one thing I hear from everyone I've talked to is the one thing they hate about NVIDIA is the proprietary nature. And I could see that and just burning bridges, right? Like, I think there is a real reason TSMC likes working with AMD. And I've been told that the sales reps that are, are new, because now AMD has money to hire sales reps, the sales reps showing up at these server companies from AMD are like way nicer and less arrogant <laughs> than the people from NVIDIA. And that if, if there was a way NVIDIA would screw all, like it's obvious, what do they do to succeed? Well, they just don't get complacent and they make these awesome APUs and bigger graphics cards and really just put in the time and effort in making sure they never lose the gaming performance. And then maybe actually put some real effort into expanding into other markets. Because I just don't think they've been successful there. But the yeah, screwing up, I think, is just burning more bridges and doubling down on proprietary, big, expensive things. I think they can be the biggest D-bags in the world if they want to, just like Apple, but they have to become Apple. You know, that's that's sure. the only way to... It's the only way to be the ultimate D-bag is that it doesn't matter. You have enough money and you can do it all on your own. Um, but yeah, the way for NVIDIA to basically screw it up um, is to, number one, just stick with the gaming. I think we mentioned that before. Mm-hmm. Eventually, DGPU is going to be server, HEDT. And I mean, maybe they'll still sell some cards for people that don't want to you know, migrate. So there might be a small market for that. Mm-hmm. Um so if they don't adapt to the times, but in the short term, what could really hurt them is if they do what they did with RTX. And what that is, yeah. is massively increase prices and not deliver performance. RTX was so bad because they didn't deliver performance. If, let's say the 2080 Ti was 30% faster than it is, and let's say the 2080 was you know 2080 oh, Ti yeah. performance, and you scale that down, everybody would be like, yeah, it's twelve hundred dollars, but I mean, it's sixty percent faster, you know. Mm-hmm. So that that really hurt them for me. I mean, I was just like, "What are you doing?" And then AMD's following suit, and then it's like, "Well, shit!" Now they're validated in it. But um, if they do that again, for example, very small updates, right. I'm completely wrong. You know, they're only ten, twenty, thirty percent faster, and then they charge more. That'll kill them. Um, so they can't do that. That's really the only thing that'll hurt them is not follow the times and the trends and adapt um, and really start pushing things like ARM and Risk Five or some other ecosystem. That's going to hurt them long term, but short term is just keep being D-bags and not delivering performance that we expect for the money. Yeah, I mean, I would agree. And, I, and it would leave such a huge opening. That's why I think they have to be aggressive. It doesn't matter if AMD delivers or not. I just think they will. 
I just think AMD will deliver a big a GPU. Maybe not RDNA 2.0, but I mean, they're they're hungry. They want, and they're out for blood. And AMD's done this before. And I guess this will bring us to kind of one of the final things I want to talk about is just Big Navi a little bit. And Fatboy Diesel writes in and he goes, considering what ATI AMD has accomplished in the past, 5970, 6950, 7970, 290X, Ryzen APUs, yeah. even Vega. Do yeah, you, they, they won most generations. Yeah, yeah. People, yeah, I know. Do you think Big Navi and Video Killer will finally be a legitimate push to the performance crown this year? I don't. You don't, don't think, think they're they... actually going to go for it? And so let's clarify. Do you think, so I guess actually he adds on too, so maybe I'll clarify for him. Would you see a repeat of the 290X with disruptive 4K performance, which is my opinion? that I really think the 290X changed the game, even if 4K wasn't standard, and that everything since then has just kind of been barely keeping up with... I mean, we're to 4K60 now, we are, but like, two, kind of. 290X basically went from 4K is legitimately not possible to it is possible now. It's a, it's a thing, yeah. And he says, or do you think it's going to be like the Fury X except with a price drop? And so I guess, what? so do you see, you don't see it as the 290X then? I think you kind of said that. I, I don't think that they're going to win. And the reason why I say that... And you that, mean against Ampere, right? Yeah, yeah, against Ampere. Anybody thinking, oh, we're, <laughs> we're competing against 2080 Ti, you're living in uh, I know, I know. You know, it's, it's two years ago, guys. Um, no, yeah, so against Ampere, the big thing that really sends out signals, it, it's the leak. I mean, we don't really know. So I have to base it off the leak that we got. Mm -hmm. But if the GA103 is a real thing... And that's the 3080, yeah. Yeah, which means that they're they're making a special class, so they're taking AMD seriously. They're not fucking that, around. That's what right? I think too. That they're taking them seriously. That's what that leak told me. Yes, but if they're taking them seriously, that means they're not going to screw around. And like I said, Nvidia does have technological advantage that we see now. Now RDNA two could flip that script, but I just can't see RDNA two being that big of a departure from RDNA one. Like we would need like a half generation jump or maybe even an entire architectural generation jump in performance for them to completely catch up. You have to remember, NVIDIA is on 12 nanometer, AMD is on 7 nanometer. We're equal. You know, when we're both on 7 nanometer, we, they would not be equal. So they have to do something pretty big to, to get there, I think. So I guess I have a few thoughts. I'd say I think our for the way I would put my opinion and again, this is a Opinion. I, I I did have a big Navi leak, but as I explained in my newest whispers of Big Navi video, that leak was like a year old. So God knows what they're actually doing right now, because I'm pretty sure yeah. it's entirely different by now again. But I, I kind of see it as I think it might be a 290x moment, but that Ampere might be a Maxwell moment. And that was the problem is the 290x came out. And it's a whole discussion, but what if Ampere was Maxwell, but it came out way closer to the 290X, right? So I guess, then that's why I kind of see NVIDIA's biggest problem this year being a logistical one. And that's why I don't think they're going to underestimate AMD because they know AMD might actually get big Navi out six months before they can effectively AM launch. And if they do, they need a swing back really hard in case it's good. Yeah, I see AMD really making a good run at it. But right, I, I that just, might be how I, I put it, right? But you have to remember back in the 290X days, you even mentioned it, AMD had technological advantage. They had the smaller die. That right there tells you same process, same everything, smaller die. They have better technology, more power efficient, kind of, I don't know. They all ran really hot that generation. Mm -hmm. But they had technological advantage pretty much up through Kepler. Once Maxwell hit, they have not had technological advantage since. Mm -hmm. So without that, NVIDIA, as long as they well, I think don't AMD, screw up. You know, might be on 7 nanometer EUV, and I, I, I'm not convinced NVIDIA is going to use 7 nanometer EUV just based on what looks like a limited amount of capacity on the EUV node. And that NVIDIA needs to pump out chips. They can't afford, you know, so I don't know. I guess, well, let me back. We'll see, though. I guess I'm not sure of that. And I think I think an opinion I have that I think might have happened is I think on the one and and I expl I don't know if you saw that Big Navi video I did but like I basically and this is my opinion that they had a rollout of a full RDNA 1.0 lineup or a mostly full that they were going to go past 40 compute units. I don't think they were going to go to 80 right away. I think they were just going to kind of scale up to about a 2080ish, a little higher maybe, 
with 60, 56 compute units, but they had all these power usage problems. So they just canceled the top half of the lineup and said, you know what? If we overclock Navi, whatever it was back then, and call it Navi 10, we can sell this because apparently NVIDIA is charging six hundred dollars yeah. for the twenty seventy now, so fuck it. We'll charge yeah, four hundred, exactly. and what was going to be our thirty sixty will just be called the fifty seven hundred XT. We need sure. more time to fix the top half of this lineup, and then we're going to roll out the you know the top half in RDNA two point and it'll be even better than it was supposed to be before. And I kind of see that happening. I see a, a I think they I think they could just go to eighty compute units. With HBM 2E, I I and, and I think they're going to have a cut-down version that uses GDR6, and I think the top version's definitely going to be at the 2080 Ti, and that might be called the 5950 XT, and I think that might even be a cut-down version of a professional card. They might not give us, AMD just might not give us the full card this time. And then below that, they're going to go to the 5900 or something, and then they'll have like the most cut-down, or it might even be a, a, another die, too. Like They might make two RDNA 2.0 dies, and this one's the 5800 XT. This is about a li- uh, I would imagine it beating the 2080 Super. And again, so uh, what I'm outlining and what I outlined in that video is what I think is an optimistic somewhat, but realistic perspective of, I think 80 comes out and crushes what they ha- NVIDIA has now. And then they go down to like 64, you know, still with GDR6 at like the $500 price point. They refresh RDNA 1.0, maybe with some of those hardware bugs fixed on the same seven nanometer node as like the 5750 XT or something. Just like they did with the RX 580. The RX 580 came out like 10 months after the 480. And then that'll just be 10% faster. They'll lower the price on that. And they'll have a good, solid lineup. They'll have, you know, they'll replace the 5700 XT with something 10% better that's a little cheaper. And it'll all be good. It's just, it depends when NVIDIA can launch. And I think NVIDIA was going to use Samsung's 7 nanometer. And now they've shifted most of their lineup to TSMC. And Whenever that comes out, I think it's just going to swing super hard. I just don't think it's going to come out to the end of the year, though. That AMD, like oh, yeah, you no. say, might have a six-month run of a $300 version of the 5700 XT. That's 10% stronger and then maybe a $450, 5800, 550, 5800 XT. And, you know, an $800 Titan RTX killer or something. Like, I think that could happen. And It could. I, I, I don't know if they're going to get Big Navi out that early though uh i'm figuring probably end of q2 may, maybe q3 so they'll beat nvidia maybe by a quarter i, I don't i don't think that's going to be that big of a deal but i actually think that you were selling amd's performance a little short um i agree that they're probably gonna have an 80 cu and a 60 cu variant and then cut down variants from there uh the 60 cu variant should compete with the 2080 ti and then the ADCU unit should be 30-ish percent faster. Oh, yeah. I, that's what I think. Ti. That's what I think crushing Titan RTX means. Yeah. Got, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So when so, I say crushing, I actually think of it in the old school ways of like crushing does not mean a narrow, the 9900KS crushing the 3950X by 4% frame rates. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you had to, yeah. had to clarify because today's language is a little strange. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's probably going to compete with the uh, 3080 class. I think the GA103 sure. is going to compete with the biggest thing, mm. the ADCU Navi. But then NVIDIA is going to have the ADTI, and it's going to be alone in its own tier. But they might make a... I'm hoping they don't do this. This is part of NVIDIA screwing up again, mm. but making another tier, price tier. <laughs> so the TI I, might be the $1,500 I think card. they're going to. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's entirely possible. This is not good for them. But yeah, so I'm expecting their well, top end card. You the saw ADTI. the rumored uh, 6144 bit HBM 2E uh, Ampere one, right? I think that was mm-hmm. one. Of, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that they might, they already moved the Titan RTX to 2500. Volta was 3000. So I think whatever they do, you know, that a 320 bit 3080, hmm. I don't know. I think, yeah, I think that's around big, big Navi, probably. Big Navi might even beat that, though. Uh, I don't know how much they're going to charge for the biggest Navi, but the 3080 Ti, yeah, I think that'll probably beat big Navi. Again, we're just going to have to see. Uh, the 3080 Ti isn't the stop. Like, if AMD goes to 80 compute units, HBM 2E, and I think they will, NVIDIA also sounds like they're planning on going to 6144 bit. Like that sounds insane. Like so, Nvidia might make the Titan like four thousand dollars. I mean, look at the thirty nine ninety X. They clearly see an opening there. Well, see, the thing is, is their uh, Nvidia's top tier is probably going to be around eighty SMs. It'll be pretty similar. 
Mm-hmm. Um, maybe a little smaller, 72, 70, somewhere in there. Um, but they don't need HBM to compete with AMD. AMD is going to need HBM to compete with NVIDIA, with what we know now. I don't know what our DNA 2 is going to bring to the table. I think it is going to be a lot more efficient, but I don't know. I also don't know how much better Ampere is going to be, right? So, Right. I'm assuming they're going to be roughly the same, or if they do advance, they advance proportionally. Sure. Um, that's, that's all we can really gauge things off of. But I would expect that the 3080 Ti will be a 384-bit GDDR6. AMD will need an 80 CU uh, Navi card. Um, with HBM to not compete with that card. It's going to need that to compete with the 320-bit 3080. That's that's what I see happening unless RDNA 2 is infinitely better than we can ever imagine. So what we just don't know about RDNA 2.0, though, is how much of a benefit it could get theoretically from developers programming specifically for it because of the consoles. Now, RDNA 1.0 was really meant to be a bridge architecture, and there's been plenty of videos that I think did a good job of explaining that, that it's meant to run the same code as GCN, because AMD just isn't capable of overhauling all of their drivers at once, like NVIDIA is. They're not as big of a company. So theoretically, though, I think the IPC increase, I don't remember what we would say it is with Navi. It seems to be like 50% higher or something crazy. It's a lot less compute units for the same performance. And because and it's easy to do this, you can just compare, you know, Radeon Seven to <laughs> it's the same performance as forty CU. So it's a nice apples to apples right there. But what I heard is you could get almost a doubling of IPC by just having them actually program for the instructions and the actual architecture that is RDNA instead of this hybrid path that we have going on right now. With the next gen consoles coming out, I guess that's what I'm saying is that's the wild card is we don't know if the maturation on programming for RDNA from the consoles will allow them to age it, kind of like how GCN 1.0 did, where, yeah, I know the Titan came out and beat the 7970 by, you know, I don't know, 40... I guess it beat the... It was a lot. It was like 40%. (laughs) But over time, it lost to it. Now, you could say it was long enough that it didn't really matter at that point. I would actually mostly agree with that statement. But... At the same time, uh, we don't know if there's a wild card here where AMD can get the devs to really program it faster than before. I don't know. Does that make sense? You see what I'm saying, though? Yeah, the the real wild card is going to come down to software. I mean, and I've talked about that before. You can literally see specific game engines pick specific teams. I, I don't care what they do. Unreal Engine 4 is never going to run better on AMD. God, just no. isn't. It's, well, it's just clearly is not, not going to, yeah. Exactly. So... That, that's the X factor that's out of everybody's control. I can look at specs and we can talk about you know expected performance gains because if you look at this stuff long enough, you kind of have a realistic idea of what things are going to happen. Um, you know, sometimes things go beyond your expectations, like you know with the Renoir GPUs. Nobody saw that happening. Mm-hmm. But you, you can kind of conservatively get a decent idea where things are going to be. But software is a complete X factor. If they really develop specifically for AMD uh, graphics, I don't. I just don't see them really going well. And again, and I think specifically because I've heard RDNA has some entirely new ways of handling things that right. you're it, just not seeing yet. Like even in the yeah. games that make the, even in the games that make the, and they exist though that make the 5700 XT actually come pretty close to a 2080 Ti. I'm wondering if RDNA 2.0 could double down on that advantage, launch around the time of the consoles. And it wouldn't be exactly right away, but we might start seeing, an, I guess I guess that's what we were saying, though, is it would take another IPC increase similar to what was GCN to RDNA 1.0 for them to have any chance of really keeping up with what we think Ampere will be. Would you, would you agree that's kind of what... I, I would agree with that. They would need that big of a jump. And I think you're right. It, it would be possible, but I just don't think... Because it's going to be on the games. It's not going to be like when this launches, games will be sure. ready to take advantage of it. It'll take five years. So almost by the next generation of consoles, it'll be very similar. Like you said, GCN 1 versus Kepler. I could see that happening. Ampere versus RDNA 2 mm-hmm. in the future. I, I will agree that that very likely could happen. Mm-hmm. And I think it's funny too, because there's a lot of evidence RDNA 1.0 is almost just a beta for the finished product. And I heard... 14 nanometer Vega effectively was just, they just said, hey, we're going to make it on this because seven nanometer is not ready. And then we can make the code uh, professional stable in time to launch our MI60 cards. And I almost wonder, I guess, again, in this wild card scenario, I almost wonder if that's what's going on. Is there 
They launch this half of a lineup so they can get ready to be actually have good drivers when the real rollout happens. Well, we know PS5 developer kits were were in hands early last year. So RDNA 1 was pushed out just because Sony was toying with the idea of dropping PS5 last Christmas. They were, yeah. With yeah, with what was out. So you know, our DNA had to be out there one way or the other so they could at least get the developer kit. So mm. they're like, we have this technology. What are they going to do? Not sell it? Yeah. I mean, that doesn't make any damn sense. So yeah, th- that's all it was designed for. If you if you have any question, it was because Sony wanted developer kits. Boom. That's why you got an RDNA one. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, because they almost could have just delayed the whole thing at those power usage problems they had late 2018. But they said, well, we can't cancel all of it. because <laughs> I mean, we literally have an obligation to get this out now. So te- I, that's actually kind of funny when you think about it, too, that half of the reason they may have not cancel the bottom half of the lineup of RDNA may have literally been because they have an obligation to get those dev kits to Sony. That's that's my guess on that one is uh, well, when Sony wants something, they jump. And how beholden AMD really is. I mean, it's not a bad thing. You know, they're a big company. They're going to buy, what, 100 million units from them or something? Mm-hmm. I mean, of course you're going to jump when they say jump. Um, it's... That that's kind of their bread and butter, you know, like how we say that gaming is Nvidia's kind of lifeline. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the PC gamers, yeah, that, that's what keeps them going. Them. <laughs> I mean, P- yeah, PS4 and Xbox that that really just keeps the lights on, no matter how bad something else goes down. Um, and that's that's kind of something that Intel doesn't really have, and they're starting to find that out, is they don't really have that lifeline in the background. So you know that that's really probably the main reason why they even kept Radeon. I, I could imagine AMD, if they didn't have the consoles, probably would have just dumped it by now. So I guess one last thing to talk about is I think we basically covered everything we were going to discuss is uh, Sockbun writes in and he says, looking at the future, uh, do you see shady practices like GPP hair works continuing in your head from a marketing perspective? Or do you see both or do you both see generic consumers waking up to such practices? Hmm. I guess, what do you think about that? Well, I don't see hair works really be, being a thing because, I think it like failed. you said, it. I mean, it it, it did. Um, it made games run worse. Mm-hmm. Developers didn't like the black box. They liked the developer money. I mean, basically, NVIDIA is like, hey, we'll give you $10 million if you put this in your game, which basically covers the cost of most games. So, you know, most companies will do that when the money's there. But... Yeah, it, it's not going to work on the consoles and it's just extra code and it's going to make things bad. Mm-hmm. So I don't think that's going to happen. Something like GPP. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If NVIDIA could find a way to do it. I think and they'll keep gonna, trying I'm, to do dumb stuff, I guess is what I'm going to flip it around. A- AMD, once they figure out that they're a market leader, they're going to try GPP. They're going to try to do stuff like this as well. So you got to keep your eyes open. None of these guys are saints. And oh no! Honestly, and honestly, if you are a mega company fighting another mega company, if you're not trying to f over the other other company, guess what? You're gonna lose. Well, so, and I think that's honestly a thing you can say about AMD is they screwed up by letting Nvidia get away with doing this. I mean, like all of yes. these things. Like, and I almost missed it because I remember in the 290x uh, announcement event, they like show like true audio, and I remember thinking that looks really cool. And apparently, you know, I talked to Cortex. He's like, that's still there. And it's a real, they have some, they have the capacity to do substantially better, uh, like 3D, uh, they call it 3D audio capabilities with Radeon graphics. They just, they just literally don't market it. Like, and I don't know why AMD is so bad at pushing their technology. I, I and just lets it's, NVIDIA <laughs> slap them around. I don't think they're going too much longer, though. You already see a new stride in AMD where I get the feeling they're they're not going to put up with that anymore. Well, they're certainly I not perfect yet. No, the, it's definitely going to be more tit for tat. So let's say if uh, NVIDIA does another GPP, AMD is going to do APP, mm-hmm. or you know, it's just going to be tit for tat because um, they have the war chest now. They they can afford it. Mm-hmm. If they go to court and it costs forty million dollars, they're like, who gives a shit? You know that we were expecting this going in. And uh, that's what these big companies do is they just take each other to court forever. And it's like a war of attrition. You try to suck out all the money through the court system and uh, while you beat them in the market. It's crazy how big businesses really, really work because it's so stupid when you really think about it. But <laughs> it's what they do. Yeah. 
All right, and I have one, one more question. Nils writes in, do you think that we will see proper price wars bringing down the entire lineup of GPUs in the next year or two? Or has AMD management change necessitated a lawsuit against price fixing or a third competitor? I'm not sure I know the last half of that question, but... I- well, well, he was saying, do we need a third competitor to bring oh. prices down? Or does somebody need to sue somebody to bring prices down? Oh. I'm going to let you answer that one first. Um, I... Oh, okay. So it would certainly be helpful. Uh, the information I've been sent from some people at Intel now, now there's a new source too, is that Intel's graphics really should not be underestimated in the low end, especially with Tiger Lake and in the short term. I mean, I don't see Intel challenging high end graphics anytime soon remotely, but it, it would certainly be nice if they got in there. And I mean, I see these other companies like Jingjia on the last Broken Silicon. The first story was this, was it Zhao Lin? Zhao Win? I, I don't speak Chinese. Company I, I don't that know. had an x86 license they were sharing with Via and it's going to be on the do-it-yourself market. I'm going to see if I can get this eight-core, eight-thread Via architecture thing because I'm just curious hmm. what the results would be with that thing. I, I like So I think we're looking at a future where there can be more People entering their space. And you have ARM who's working on it too. We know that. So I think there that it could happen. I just think a lot of these companies might, if they try to enter the graphics space, underestimate how much work it is to enter a new market. Like when some people try to enter a console market, it's actually quite hard to do well in the console market or the automotive market. Oh, yeah. I guess to answer the overall question, I, I think prices will not be as dumb as Turing. I think you're already seeing the prices go down. Like, and that's why I talked about the 5600 XT, where I'm like, look, I mean, I frankly, I think the 5600 XT should be 250. And it annoys me to see AMD finally copy NVIDIA and make shitty 192 bit cards, which again, mm-hmm. it just it bothers me 192 bit. If it's not a mobile card, that makes sense to save energy. But in the desktop, it annoys me uh, every time I saw that because it just doesn't age as well. But, anyways, I. It, but it did force some prices down. I mean, the 2060 got a price drop. We're seeing the cards slowly drift down in price again, and that's going to get close to 5500 XT. That will start dropping a little in price. By the time Big Navi and the refresh of Navi 1.0, or yeah, Navi 10 comes out, uh, I do think prices will be drifting a bit lower for graphics this year. I, I, I think so. I think it's more likely that we have prices get a bit better this year, especially with the consoles coming out too, than... I really think twenty set late twenty seventeen through twenty nineteen is just going to be remembered the the years of the shitty graphics prices. I don't know we're ever yeah. getting back to where they used to be. Not saying that, but that's my opinion. Yeah, the dark the dark ages there between the uh, mining and- mining boom and then RTX right afterwards. Yeah, it was the one two gut punch. Um, all right, so as far as I think he was more talking about like next generation, so 3000 series versus RDNA I guess that's what too. I'm saying, though, is I think we're drifting lower in prices now, and you're going to have AMD swing at NVIDIA pretty hard, whether they win or not. They're going to mm-hmm. swing, and I think AMD NVIDIA is going to be forced to swing back at AMD extra hard to make sure they don't lose their position. So, so I do think prices will be better next gen, though. That is what I'm saying. I, I do agree with you on that. I do believe that the RTX prices, I think they swung a little too high. <laughs> yeah. And and I think that they knew it. Um, mostly due, like I said, because the performance gains weren't there. It's not so much that the price tiers were bad. It, they just weren't fast enough for those prices, I think. Um, so I think things will be more appropriate this time and make up for that on, on both sides. So you'll get a lot more bang for your buck this next generation. I do believe... The next X70 class, you know, it'll be 399 to 499. I'm hoping they do like 450, like right in between, a little bit cheaper than RTX. Yeah. Um, but that's probably going to be 2080 Ti level. And that's less than half of a 2080 Ti. So I don't think people will be too upset with that. No. Much like what we, you know, we got 980 Ti at the uh, 1070, which was like 400, $450. So I, I think that they're smart enough to know that that's going to be a big win and that card will sell like gangbusters. Um, well, and, and I, and I think have... they learned, right, that people will just buy the top card, even though it's not the top card, the 2080. Like they just discovered with what it, what was it? Titan Maxwell was the first one to be 1200, I think. Like they just found they. No, it was the Pascal. It was, was the, the Pascal one. one. Okay. So they're like, hey, $1,200 is that price point. So that's where we're going to put that. But I think they learned, I don't know, was it $800 for the 2080? Like I think they learned that's just a bit too high for something mm-hmm. that isn't next-gen capabilities, that people aren't just going to buy that again. Yeah, there's this weird thing where the 80 class almost seems irrelevant. 
you know, you have your X70 class, which is what most enthusiasts buy. That's what enthusiasts, for the most part, will get. And then it's really cheap crap thereafter. But out of the high-end cards, the X70 level outsells all the rest of them. And then nobody really cares about the 80, even though it's faster, because they know there's going to be an 80 Ti. So anybody who wants an 80 will just wait for the 80 Ti, and then they just spend however much that is. So you go from 500 to 800 for a card that nobody wants, you know. But, yeah, exactly. You know, th they're okay with spending 1200 on the best. So I think I think that will be cheaper. I think the 3080, even like let's say they have a 10 and 20 gigabyte version, I think they will launch with that first again, probably. And they will have a 10 gigabyte 3080 that, you know, is, you know, I think instead of going to 800, they'll go to like 700. And then they'll have the 20 gigabyte version for like a thousand. And that'll pave the way for, you know, their 3080 Ti for 1500 or something. I, that's kind of how I see it shaking out. But it will be like twice as strong. Well, maybe not twice, but, you know, it'll be way stronger than the previous gen, though. And the prices oh, yeah. will overall come down, I think. Well, I expect the 3080 Ti 50 to 60% faster than the 2080 Ti. Um, then the 3080 will be about 30% faster than the 2080 Ti. Now, Big Navi, if you're right and it launches first, uh, the ADCU version, which will likely need HBM to really oh, yeah. push that. It, it will. Um, that's probably going to be a $1,000 card, I, sure. I would figure, from AMD. That'll probably be $999 or possibly $1,200. Whatever price that is. And it'll be the Frontier replacement, right? The Radeon 7, the Vega Frontier replacement card is what I think they'll position that as. I don't think they'll make it its own thing like they did with those. I think it's just going to be, you know, 60, mm. 90, you know, 6950 XT. And they will be 6,000 series. We know that from the conference call. So they're going to be 6,000 series. Is that what they said? I, I I guess I don't know that that's what uh, I honestly interpreted it that it's going to be an RX 580 situation, not a new architecture for the 5700. That that's what I interpreted it as. No, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, okay. Yeah, no, it's it's going to be RDNA one. It's going to be the exact oh, okay. same card, but they're going to call it the 6700 or the 6600. They might. Back to this guy's original question. Yeah, prices will be better. We'll get better performance. Um, I don't think we're going to get screwed. Um, but even if you do see like a $1,500. X80 Ti, mm, mm -hmm. it, it'll technically be worth the price because you'll get that extra performance. You, and it might be 24 gigabytes. Like it'll be, it'll be substantially oh, yeah. better than before. Oh, yeah, it would have to be. Um, but yeah, they'll, but NVIDIA, as far as pricing, um, they'll just price in line with AMD and they'll be like equal to if they come later mm -hmm. um, and slightly slower. Or if they're faster, they're going to price a little higher. That's just what they'll do. Yeah. And I think, you know, the fact that AMD may actually, take the crown for a few months, <laughs> even if it's just a few, will force right. prices lower. There's always been this argument AMD only needs to compete in the mid-range. I just I think that's been proven to be a hundred percent false. That the fact that they never went for the crown recently, I mean it was a decision, right? Obviously they didn't have they have only so many resources, so it's understandable. But I think it's materialized that like NVIDIA will just be able to milk more if they can say they have the performance crown. Because people just look at the crown and buy the other thing. They really do. And it basically makes it so NVIDIA only has to compete in price at a few levels, but even not really. I mean, you look at like used, well, not even used, just even at a certain point, new Vega 56s were going for like 250, 280. And you had people buying 1660s instead. And so I don't know. <laughs> That's just marketing. That is, that all comes down to marketing. And we could talk about that. That's a whole podcast. Yeah. So I think we caught, I think that was a pretty damn clean, good episode that was very straightforward from start to finish. So I'm sure we'll do another one. I look forward to coming on News with the Good Old Gamer or what are you, what are you calling it? Oh, I haven't, I haven't even got a name yet. That's, that's why I haven't announced anything. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it'll basically just be more of a, like a news channel, news type of thing. So anybody got some cool names for it? Throw it in the, the comment section. I'll check them out. Yeah. And you could, uh, yeah, a daily tech news, or I don't know if you would do it multiple days or like... Yeah, tech's, tech's not that big. I'm thinking like two days a week. Sure. Maybe that's enough time to build up enough stories. Yeah. It, yeah, and I think you could do it a lot better than uh, some other channels I've railed against that shove out news videos every day. So I would like if I could click on someone <laughs> that uh, did not annoy me with clickbait rumors that have horrible analysis, so... Well, I'm definitely excited <laughs> to see that. And I think you know who I'm talking about. But 
Uh, I do. Uh, it's kind of the staple. I think at the end of every one of our videos, you got to talk about this guy. Yeah. Uh, people ask me, is it because he says Narvi? And I'm like, why would I care how he pronounces a word? No. All right. Well, I'm sure we'll do this again soon. Uh, thanks for coming on. Pleasure being here with you. And uh, yeah, I guess I don't know. Have a good evening. Best wishes. Bye-bye. You too, my friend. We'll do it again soon. All right. The following podcast was brought to you by the YouTube channel and website, Moore's Law is Dead. Moore's Law is Dead and Broken Silicon are trademarks of their creator, Tom. That guy is me, and I am indeed the creator, editor, writer, and showrunner of Moore's Law is Dead podcast, videos, articles, and other media. However, Moore's Law is Dead is a team with Broken Silicon co-hosted by my brother, Dan, audio editing by Gerard Cortez, and select technical editing by Carbon Cry. You can find all of our information, including how to get a hold of us, at www.moreslawsdead.com. And if you are a fan and would like to send mail or other hardware, please mail parcels to Moore's Laws Dead, P.O. Box 10468, Peoria, Illinois, 61612. And speaking of fans, without exaggeration, the patrons are solely responsible for the continued distribution of the content you just listened to. And so if you have some extra money, but only if you do, please consider supporting us. For just $2 a month, you get access to the exclusive podcast Die Shrink, voting on subjects of future podcast episodes, the ability to have your questions read aloud on Broken Silicon, Die Shrink, and Loose Ends, and of course, the Moore's Law is Dead Discord, full of like-minded people who would love to meet you. I am one of them. The Discord is only at $1, and at higher tiers, you get access to ad-free episodes of Broken Silicon, the back catalog of Flyover States podcast, thanks in the credits of videos and podcasts and other perks as well. And if you cannot afford to support us, please just share Moore's Laws Dead videos and podcasts with friends and family on social media and Reddit. And give Broken Silicon and Flyover States a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. All of this really does help so much more than I think anyone realizes. If you'd like to advertise on the podcast or a person of interest who would like to be a guest, please reach out to the email address mlhbdead at gmail.com. But as I said, this podcast would not be possible without its fans supporting it. And so now it is time to give a personal thanks to the greatest of the fans. Bootman, Hunter Drake, Dean, Benny Berlin, Justin Yant, Thomas Rupp, I Love You, Lynn and Jim, Bollocks, Jordan Betcher, Mohammed Alkawari, Carbon Cry, Prime Tech TV, Justin Parrish, Zachary Martin, Terrence Herod, Carl Marco, Phil S., Thyrister, The Ninth Dude, Greg Renegar, John Bible, Christian Teen, Night Rogue 77, The Mechanical Philosopher, Lebo Kinkilo, Fatboy Diesel, Derek Evans, Matthew McMullen, Christoph Novak, Neil X01, Matt Salem, Aaron Close, Sexy, Scott Shope, Frederick Lau, Richter Cohagen, Alethros, Telos, Kaiden, Greg T. Wanchuk, Jacob Barber, XOT, Whiny Care Bear, Matthew Lane, Paul Jones, Jan Rauner, Robert Ducks, Michael Costa, Ali Robertson, Gordon Lamb, Sadler Sadler, and Drita Full. Of course, thank you to Sahara for the music.